just been watching a preview of the London Museum of Water and Steam and as a musical introduction I thought that the Stravinsky Symphony in Three Movements really fitted the bill. It captured the rhythm and motion of the place. Anyway look for now let us head for quieter places in this latest instalment of Secret London number four. There are not many London boroughs where you are likely to find cows grazing peacefully in the open expanses of a field. Huge areas of Bromley and Croydon reach out to the upper regions of the North Downs, and in North London Enfield still has its chase a former royal hunting forest. Now not far away, the green fields at Totteridge are surrounded by the urban sprawls of Edgware, Barnet and Finchley, and you don't have to half close your eyes to imagine that you are in the country. Also exceptional is the Dollis Valley Green Walk, a secret green corridor commencing at Barnet that takes a secluded route by the Dollis Brook between Totteridge and Whetstone through Finchley, finishing at Hampstead Garden Suburb, not far from St Jude's, an imposing early 20th century church with a Lachens interior. It is blessed by its unique location, away from noisy traffic and shops, and as a consequence it is used by record companies for CDs of classical music. Croydon may not be an obvious choice for a secret London location, but very often the unforeseen reveals itself as a complete surprise, and to top it all, next door to the bus station. As a town, Croydon has had a mixed history, maybe undeservedly. It is only nine miles from the centre of London, and has tried unsuccessfully to gain city status. Today, it is dominated by huge tower blocks, but hidden amongst them are some architectural gems, and the church of St. Michael and All Angels is one example worth seeking out. It may not look it from the outside, but inside is an example of spaciousness, with no screens interrupting the view down the nave to the chancel. The architect was J. L. Pearson, designed in 1876 when he was regarded at the peak of his powers. Check opening times first outside services.
Whilst south of the capital, and a couple of boroughs away, there is a National Trust property that may have missed your hit list. The Red House was the only house that William Morris built, who was one of the most important figures of the arts and crafts movement. It is in Bexley, overlooking the Cray Valley, but its rural setting is no more. Although Morris lived at Red House for only five years, it is reckoned that the place shaped his life. A motto in Latin over the fireplace says, Life is short, but art is endures. As an example, and not far away, is Standon House in West Sussex, near East Grinstead, one of the best illustrations of a house decorated by Morris, who also believes that good design and good life are inseparable. If in your wanderings around Bexley you pass Danson House, take a look. It is worth a bit of your time. Today, the buzzword is influencers. People who come to public recognition through their work, maybe not intentionally. A visit to Enfield in North London may include Forty Hall. If so, don't overlook Middleton House, less than a mile away. It was the home of E. A. Bowles, who became one of the great gardeners in the 20th century and an expert on many plants. The house is not open to the public, but the garden will hold the interest for photographers even in the depths of winter when light is favourable. The garden was restored in 2009, taking two years to complete, and opened by the then Duchess of Cornwall, now Queen Camilla, on 5th of May 2011. And so we return to the London Museum of Water and Steam, which tells the story of London's water supply. Opened in 1838, the Grand Junction Waterworks once supplied water to a large part of West London, from an area previously occupied by market gardens. By 1900, Kewbridge Waterworks employed around 80 men, but closure of the station was considered as early as 1910, and because of the First World War and subsequent depression, it failed to invest in new equipment, relying on steam instead of diesel or electric pumps, which were installed later. Life at the station is a fascinating story, and a booklet is available from the museum. In 1974, a trust was formed with the objective to open Kewbridge Pumping Station to the public, where much of the equipment had been saved from the scrap heap. I was fascinated by the shapes and architecture of the site, and it is that I have tried to show. This is the fourth program in this series, and when I thought of the project several months ago, I had no idea how revelatory it would prove, not only for out-of-the-way places within Greater London, but also those quiet corners secreted from public gaze within the most popular of locations. More on the way.